Um, so uh, online, um, do you want to tee this up for us, Melissa? Yeah, absolutely. Um, is it? It's recording now. That's good. Yes. Okay. Perfect. All right. So um, thanks everyone who was able to call in this morning. My name is Melissa Houston, and I work on Alaska SourceLink, which is a program of the University of Alaska Center for Economic Development. And we are hosting this Build Your Business Rural webinar series, um, hoping to cover a lot of topics that are of interest and that will hopefully provide helpful information to entrepreneurs in rural Alaska. We have with us this evening Rick Wilk of Rosewood Coaching, and he's going to be giving a fabulous presentation entitled Green Gazelles in Rural Alaska, all about the opportunities and obstacles to economically and ecologically effective rural businesses. But before we go, I'm going to give a, this is probably a five or ten minute brief overview of Alaska SourceLink as a program. Unfortunately, I don't have the PowerPoint that accompanies what I'm going to be saying uh, available up on the screen. We are recording today's session, and we will be posting the recording on alaskasourcelink.com in our webinar archive. And when we post the recording, I will also post a copy of Rick's PowerPoint, if that's okay with him. Absolutely. Okay. I will will post this PowerPoint, which I'm referencing as I'm talking about the program. So even though you don't have that visual right now or any of the links to follow, that will be available for download on the Alaska Source Link website. So just to give you a, a brief glimpse into who we are as Alaska Source Link, uh, we are a free online tool is is here to help entrepreneurs in rural Alaska get connected with the different university, nonprofit, and governmental resources that can help them to start or expand a business. We do by accessing a network of 145 different resource partners located all around the state. Like I said, these are universities, nonprofits, or governmental entities. Uh, some of them are regionally based, like Chambers of Commerce. Others are uh, statewide, like the State of Alaska Department of Commerce, Community, and Economic Development or the Small Business Development Center, which services statewide and has different regional offices through which they do that. Um, so there are a few different ways that you can interact with Alaska SourceLink as a website, and like I said, it is completely free to do so. First, we have our resource navigator, which is how you get in touch with that network of resource partners. Um, it's pretty cool because without even knowing which resource providers are out there, you're able to go to aksourcelink.com and put in a little bit of information about you, about your business, where you're located, and what sort of assistance you're seeking. And it will generate a list of resource providers who can help you with your business need. Um, what list has been generated, you can turn it into a PDF and save it to your computer, or you can print it out. But it gives you the contact information for each of those resource providers, as well as a little bit of information about who they are and what they do. So you can choose who you want to give a call and who you want to work with to help meet this need that you have. Another resource is the resource library. And through that, you can browse different business-related topics, get just a, a complete way of information. So all of the topics are separated out into different categories. For instance, there's Doing Business in Alaska that talks about, you know, what are some of the specific permitting processes to doing business around the state? What are some of the obstacles that you should think about? And what are some of the benefits? Um, there's a section specifically for financing, information about different loan programs through the Small Business Administration, for example, um, and all sorts of different information like that. So as opposed to the Resource Navigator, where you're getting kind of that one-on-one -on -one business assistance, with the Resource Library, you can just browse through a number of topics, follow different links, and get a lot of general information through that way. We are a source link blog and we update that about once or twice a week. It's actually a shared blog that we do with our US source link affiliates all around the country. So that blog is going to center around a lot of business tips and trends and talk from all around the country. Um, I think that that's pretty cool because it's not just getting the Alaska perspective on business, but really it's tapping into that national perspective. On the side of that, we have our AK Source Link newsletter. It's a newsletter, so it goes out to your email once a month. And that newsletter, we're able to focus a little bit more about things that are going on in Alaska and business things that are more pertinent to what's happening locally on this Alaska statewide and regional level. 
that is free to subscribe to. So if you're interested in getting with that newsletter, it's the best way to stay up to date with everything that we're doing through AK Source Link. You can do so on the homepage of aksourcelink.com. And then finally, we have our events calendar, which lists a number of different business events that are happening all around the state. There is five by color, so you can interact with the calendar and pick and choose from which type of events you want to see. If you look beneath the calendar, there's also a map of Alaska, and that too is interactive map where you can click on region and then it will change what's on the calendar to only those events which are available to you in your region or the region that you selected from the map. So that's neat because it, it lets you know what's out there and what's available and especially for folks based in rural Alaska where there might not be as much opportunity for person-to-person on-the-ground interaction, there's still a lot of opportunity available via webinars or teleconferences just like we're doing tonight. So those are resources that are listed on the calendar as well that you don't want to miss. Finally, you can connect with AK Source Link through social media. We have a Facebook page, which is updated pretty regularly. You can find at facebook.com backslash AK Source Link. And we also have a Twitter account, and you can follow us on Twitter at AK Source Link. Finally, um, you're not able to see the contact screen, but if you do need personalized assistance and you're looking can talk to the phone with someone on one, you can contact myself. Um, my address and phone number are available through this PowerPoint once it gets up on the website. There's also a toll-free hotline with Alaska Source Link. Um, that number is 885-LINK-K or 888-54-6525. And again, that number is listed on the website, and that phone rings at my desk as well as at a few other desks in my office. So. That's a way if you're having any trouble navigating the website or have any questions that you'd rather just talk to a real person about, you can reach us at that number as well. Finally, I just want to remind you all that we do have two more webinars in this series before we wrap it up. Uh, the next one will be on September 10th from 2 to 3 p.m. It will be Michael Hanzuk of the State of Alaska Department of Commerce, Community, and Economic Development talking about some different business resources that are available from the state. And then finally, on September 17th, 2 to 3 p.m., um, I will be talking about a business plan breakdown. It's just going to be a brief introduction into the different parts of the business plan and how to get started writing a business plan. So we hope that you'll be able to attend those webinars as well. If you're interested in registering for those, go ahead and email me the same way that you did to register for this webinar, and we'll get you all signed up. And with that, um, I want to thank Rick again for being here to present with us this evening, and I will turn it over to him. All right. Th thank you very much, Melissa. Since there's just a couple of people on the call, um, Melissa, Chris, and Ruth, could you just uh, quickly introduce yourselves, please? I guess I'll jump right in there. I'm uh, Napoli. I'm from Dillon, Alaska. I uh, have been uh, a builder for the last uh, years out here in Dillingham. I also work uh, full time for BBEDC. Uh, and I'm interested to know more, Rick. Thanks, Chris. Hi, this is Lisa Eden, and I work for the Cooperative Extension Service. And I also worked on um, AK Source Link for um, I think about two and a half years, um, and I do um, social media for uh, Cooperative Extension Service as well as um, doing some um, uh, economic development and small business development with the Cooperative Extension Service. Thanks. Thanks. So, do you want to let Chris and Ruth know what the Cooperative Extension Service does? What sort of their mission is? Oh, um, we uh, provide um, education and outreach to the general public. It's um, a non-academic type of classes and um, education. We do it on, on a ton of different topics, um, with, from horticulture, plants, gardening, um, youth development. Um, we have some tour, tourism education. There's um, been a lot of work done lately on food businesses in Alaska and food entrepreneurs, and there's a new publication out on how to how to run a um, food business. Um, 
so uh, there's a whole bunch of and food preservation. That's another biggie at the office. So, want to find you? How do they find you? Um, so, uh, since people are from different places, I would go to um, the statewide office. So, either put in um, Cooperative Extension Service Alaska into Google, or if you go to www.uaf.edu and do the backslash and CES. CES for Cooperative Extension yes. Service. Great. Yes, and, take you and, back to our main page. Thank you very much. And Ruth doesn't have audio, but she can text in a little bit. So, Ruth, tell us where you're from and, and what you're doing. I did. Because I know that Melissa doesn't have the screen in front of her. She says she's new to Alaska from Texas and she's interested in learning more about business resources available in the state. And Ruth, where are you based? She's in Anchorage. Okay, cool. And, and I'm on my way to Texas tomorrow, as a matter of fact. I think I told earlier I'm on my way to Dallas for some business. So anyway, uh, thank you for joining me. Um, this is a project that I've been working on for many years, and uh, many years, so how many? Uh, Four-ish, something like that. Um, it was part of my Ph.D. research. Uh, I've been teaching at the University of Alaska for the last eight years. I taught at Alaska Pacific University for three years. that, I've been running businesses in form or another for uh, more years than I can remember, but if I say it's about 20, that's about right. Um, and it's a lot of fun. And, and uh, so there was a need to do a little research uh, in uh, regarding how to help businesses in rural Alaska, and uh, that's where this uh, that's where this com comes from. I'm now working uh, as the chief growth officer at an executive coaching business that my wife started, uh, Rosewood Coaching. Um, and uh, rosewoodcoaching.com is the website, and uh, you can learn more about us there. But went to the the stuff for, for entrepreneurs in rural Alaska. Just a reminder, entrepreneurship. I think about that as people who are taking risk risks and starting something new, um, and often with resources that they don't directly control. So you you guys are, and ladies are pulling in resources that uh, that may necessarily be be your bank account or being who's walking into your office, uh, be sort of mobilizing resources around you, like um, like resources that you might find on SourceLink, for instance, or through the Cooperative Extension Service. Uh, to have some fun with this, um, and Melissa, I've seen these slides before, some of them anyway, I, I talk, talk about the, um, uh, the entrepreneurial animal crackers or different entrepreneurial animals. Uh, and uh, you can think of this as mice, uh, you can think of this as elephants, and you can think of this as gazelles. And remember, this is the green gazelles in rural Alaska, sort of what we call this presentation. So the mice, think of this as, as these, are, these are the one person, half a person businesses, uh, very small, they don't grow very much, and they only contribute marginally to employment growth nationally and in the state of Alaska. There's nothing wrong with them. Uh, they're wonderful. Um, uh, they're important, they're incredibly important. But uh, just to put it in context, this is one type of business. The type of business, um, the elephants, and these are the, the very, very large employers. Um, they have a share of the people who are working for them. Um, you can think of Ford Motor Company. You can think of uh, AT&T, Verizon. Um, but as a cohort, as a group, they don't generate that many new jobs. And the reason is, uh, they get that big, they start to really try to figure out how to be more efficient, and they may be looking at they can shed jobs. Um, so if Ford hires 10,000 people, but uh, Verizon fires 10,000 people, you can sort of see the churn there, and there are any new jobs created. These cells, on the other hand, are a small group of high growth firms. These are the ones that generate the most net new jobs in the private sector of the economy. And that's what I was focusing on, because if, if we're looking to help Alaska grow, um, and help rural Alaska grow. It's it's going to be through these jobs. All three types of uh, through these types of companies. All three are critically important. Um, there's not one that's more important than the other. But it's the need to sort of pay attention to these and, and they end up becoming gazelles with a little bit of help. And that's what I was trying to uh, research a little bit. And as I'm um, adding, if folks have questions, please just jump in. Uh, if I'm not being clear, if I'm 
uh, you question that's important to Dingham or Anchorage or if that, uh, please just write in. Um, the, so anyway, there's my, uh, Alyssa can't see this, but it's my, my drawing of the green gazelle <laughs> that I used. So, yeah. Road system, um, and so uh, rural entrepreneurs who are aspiring to grow 20% or more uh, revenue uh, annually uh, are looking to hire 20 or more employees, and that's and that's what sort of zells are. That, that when they talk about fast growth, um, isn't huge, uh, but it would have a, a low uh, put out there to see if uh, businesses were willing to try to grow to grow their bottom line, uh, sorry, to grow their top line. I was looking at revenue growth. And they were going to hire 20 or more employees, but that was possible. They were thinking, you know what, I, I can see if I can grow this business large enough, there uh, be some opportunity for me to hire more people, which is good for the economy in some of these rural communities as well. And because um, I was interested in sustainability issues, I also thought, let's look at some ecological metric on how these business businesses that are looking to grow at 20% or more could improve their ecological footprint by some metric, maybe 20%. We didn't know exactly what that was. And I, I didn't look specifically at social effectiveness, um, but that's really important. Also, thing that uh, just to keep the research a little more streamlined, I said, well, if we can pay attention to the ecological footprint of, the, of these companies, that has social impact as well because people care the environment. Uh, in local community. And so for those who are online, you can see a new girl with little Mickey Mouse down there with a, a, a sort of the cloud hoping one day to become a, a green gazelle. Not that they should be green gazelles to start or even to get there in the process, just they were trying. Uh, so w w for fun line, I had some fun with this. I made a presentation in Spain. We've all seen the map of Alaska that overlaps the lower 48, which is from Florida to California and up to Canada, but since I was talking to some folks and I thought I'm on the board of the World Trade Center of Alaska, I thought we'd put a little international spin on this and show how Alaska stretches from Morocco up to the Netherlands, uh, over to the Czech Republic, uh, Austria, and down all the way as far as Greece. So uh, geography is certainly an issue for us. Um, just wanted to have some fun with that. Something else that was important was this whole concept of sustainability entrepreneurship. And that's about business. You can think of it as triple bottom line, who, who paying attention to the environmental side of things, the social side of things, and the economic side of things. So sort of think of a, a jet plane with three engines on it. And um, <clears throat> some fun um, being around. It wasn't the main part of the research, but it was kind of curious about entrepreneurship in rural Alaska. And I thought, you know, there's a, lot of, um, there's a large Alaska Native population in rural communities, and I thought, I wonder if the um, they're important regarding sustainability entrepreneurship might also be important to uh, Native values. And so I did a presentation in Southeast Alaska. I was living down in Juneau for a while, and I pulled up uh, some of the Southeast traditional tribe values. This was from an elders forum in 2004. Um, all of these, but respect for self and elders uh, and others, uh, patients, pride and family, clan, traditions, uh, that's found in love, loyalty, and generosity, um, risk for nature and property, uh, be strong, have courage, hold each other up. So those are some, some of the, the values that the, the elders come up with in the Southeast. Uh, not completely different from the values that I've seen in other parts of the state. I've seen uh, Arctic, I've also seen uh, Northwest. Um, and so then I sort of plotted that on that same stability on entrepreneurship on the environmental side, and C, respect for nature, so those are on the, in green the left, uh, respect for self and elders, love, loyalty, generosity, that's sort of the social side of things. And for, for people like uh, Ruth and, uh, and Chris and others who are, who are this later who are running business, on the economic side of things, we know how important courage and patience is. And I did this as I just wanted to be able to do a reality test, see if, in fact, um, sustainability on entrepreneurship might be easily adopted in the context of uh, local Alaska Native values. And, and I made this presentation, and, and it was well received. So um, something to think about um, for folks, uh, you know, whether you're an artist or, 
or whether you were an athlete uh, or were an entrepreneur, uh, this is between expert and novices. And you can come up with lots of different definitions of what's an expert and what's a novice, and you can find some of them. But one that I used uh, comes from some research that a, a very bright lady named Sarah Saras uh, developed when she was at Carnegie Mellon as part of her P program. And she followed a period of time about 24 very, very successful entrepreneurs. I'll call those expert entrepreneurs. These are folks who had been around at the start of the business and we're still with the business as it had grown to between $600 million and $1.2 billion in revenue. And, you know, that, you know, for folks who are, uh, I don't know if, if Ruth or Chris or Melita or Lisa agree or not, but if you get between $600 million and $1.2, we can, we can sort of put a thumbtack there and say, that's pretty darn good. We got an expert. Um, novices, on the other hand, that folks that I was working with had businesses between 100000 and a million dollars. And so certainly found that there was a process that these experts used and called it effectuation. Uh, and that was very different than what um, people were teaching in business schools, what people were learning about through SBDCs around the country. Uh, and so I thought this would, be, this would be important as we tried to help these businesses to grow, to take a look and see uh, what takes to uh, work with the entrepreneur to help them get on that that uh, that that uh, 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 that escalator that takes them higher to, to bigger places. So that's why I use the escalators as images here. And the the methodology it wasn't just a survey that I was doing. I was actually working with folks um, uh, hand in hand, rolling up my sleeves. And there's a, a methodology called participatory action research, and it's basically um, a cycle of plan, act, reflect, uh, and so what's going on, make a plan, and make up and watch and listen, think and discuss and change your plan. And so, so I went out, went off with this, and we and we worked this for for, for a few years with uh, with the companies here in Alaska. Plan, act, observe, and react. Participatory reaction research, and that that was able to involve folks, not just me and the entrepreneur. Uh, but also people who were part of the ecosystem. It could have been BDC people. It could have been folks from NGOs, non-governmental organizations, who helped entrepreneurs. Um, it could be people of the state, state government. Um, to bring in, it could be consultants. So we, in, for entrepreneurs, different folks also participated in this. It was a way to facilitate behavior change and change the trajectory of the business from that smaller, sort of lower level uh, escalator to the uh, faster level, the higher escalator. The five principles of effectuation, uh, since they say pictures are worth a thousand words, and Melissa doesn't have the pictures, but um, she'll see it when she watches this. That's okay. <laughs> uh, you'll hear the video too. So um, one of the one of the five principles is uh, affordable loss. Um, another, and that's sort of you can't control the no idea uh, what the side of your business is going to be. So these very successful entrepreneurs said, okay, we can't control, we don't know what the upside is going to look like, but we can manage risk by controlling the downside. It's time that we'll put this and so much money. And it'd be um, it, just the business as well as each iteration of growth in the business. Yeah. New, new things that businesses would try because uh, the business plan and the business model certainly change between when you're doing thousand dollars of revenue to when you're doing a, bil a billion dollars in revenue. You try some things, some work, some don't, but this was something that, that these 24 very successful entrepreneurs used. Another is uh, the bird in hand. Um, in putting a list together, the things that you need to start your business, what the, these entrepreneurs did was they looked at what resources they had in the bird, so to speak, uh, who, they, who they were, uh, what they and whom they knew. And the next piece is uh, it's a quilt. Um, so the crazy quilt principle is how these entrepreneurs would interact with willing and trusted stakeholders to add value to the business. And an example might be, let's say I come up with an idea for a pen. I want to start a company that makes Alaska pens. And I run into, I run into Melissa, and she's an entrepreneur in Salmon. Uh, she's decided she's going to move out there because she likes it so much, and the antler in is great. 
and says, well, Rick, you know, I can't really do much for you with pain, but, you know, some of my family have had some heart issues lately, and I'm doing investigation on these very small chips, but if I could put the chip in a pen, and that could sort of broadcast people's uh, car information, I'd be really interested in that. And so suddenly I'm going, okay, that sort of ties into that, that lemonade, the glass of lemonade, the lemonade principle. Well, that's a bit of a crow. I was kind of hoping Melissa would work with me on this pen thing, but I could put a chip in that pen. Why not, right? It wasn't part of my business plan. I'd never thought about it. Wouldn't have even thought about it if I hadn't run into Melissa. And she come on, let's do it. So I go, okay, that sort of fits with what I'm able to do. And suddenly, sh- sh- sort of, I'm able to double the size of my business in an area that I was never even thinking about before. So that adds resources to me. And the fifth is that pilot in the plane. And there's so much that we can't control in entrepreneurship. By sort of following these practices, um, we have more control over the direction in which we're going. So I'll put it into pictures. I'll put it into words also, and uh, and then I'm going to play a very short video. It's about th- less than three minutes. It's from the Kauffman Foundation, and uh, w- one of the things that I learned, and I'll get back to this uh, later in the presentation, is just go out to rural Alaska and talk about this stuff with entrepreneurs once is enough, um, and just to go out there twice sometimes isn't enough. And sometimes people need to make three trips to King Sam or Dillingham. Some's going over the same information, and it's not that uh, the entrepreneurs aren't sharp. Uh, it's just that busy. They've got other things on their mind. It may not be applicable at that time. There's a bit of a problem for for people who are trying to help entrepreneurs because um, you know it's expensive to get out to these communities. But, but to, it's, it's a little bit of a conundrum. So just just wanted to share that. That was one of the findings from this as well. So you're going to bear with me for one second, and I'm going to uh, video for you, and Melissa told me that I go to quick and share my desktop, and and how am I doing so far? So good. And here's that video that I was telling you about from the Kauffman Foundation. And again, you it in pictures. You sent uh, the list of, of these <clears throat> five, five principles, and now I'll, I'll play a, a, just a real quick uh, video for you. Able to see Rick's screen? I'm just yeah. Say that again? I'm Melissa? making sure everyone can see your screen all right. Okay, I'll, I'll start again. Yeah. <laughs> 
to the, uh, the um, so and effectuate.org effectuate.nl is the Netherlands and when I first tried to find that video I I with the Dutch version so if you speak Dutch go to the effectuation.nl but if you don't speak Dutch um, effectuation.org or look for effectuation uh, video English and you'll find that so um, the company I was working with it was over a two year period um, office equipment health and safety Safety, financial services, information technology, um, again, all, all communities off the road system who were uh, willing to participate with me based on the criteria that I shared with you earlier. And that video is important that I just played. You know, I talked to entrepreneurs, let's say, for the first year, and without showing them the video, um, at first, just using sort of, sort of a, a more graphs and images and pictures, um, it, we, we were doing fine. But for some people, people learn differently. Um, one of the entrepreneurs saw the video about a year in and said, I finally get exactly what you're talking about. So and that's that's going back to um, what I mentioned earlier about how sometimes we have to share information with entrepreneurs once, twice, three times, even more to really helpful for them as, as uh, source link or, or extension source or um, researchers like, like myself. Some of the obstacles that folks found and we found, because we did this together um, with the entrepreneur, uh, some of the obstacles and opportunities. Obviously, geography is a bit of an issue. Um, scarce intermittent availability of expert assistance, sort of getting to what I was talking about earlier, even though we can get to places like Dillingham and King Salmon sometimes, we can't get there often enough. And um, uh, it's focusing on growing a business in your community. You're, you're in a bit of a, a, tr a bit of a bind as far as economies of scale. You can't grow all that big. And there aren't that many, especially with the Grizzell model, there weren't many other businesses that uh, that participants, entrepreneurs can look at and go, oh, I can be like them. So in other words, analogs, um, they weren't around. They might have been, they have been the only one that was trying to do that. And if you're trying to do it and you're the first one out, you don't have other people to sort of show you the way as, as examples. So that was one of the obstacles. As well. But the strengths go back to we all have our strengths, and those are related a lot to the bird in the hand. It's what we know, whom we know, uh, and, and who we are. I want to think of, of, um, think of the resources that you have at your disposal. Um, are currently, uh, this is from uh, uh, Karen's book on strategic management. You look at any business, and you've got customers, assuming you've started the business already, which the folks that I was working with have started of the business, but customers are certainly a means at hand that you have. You've got products. Uh, some, of, some of them may be ideas in screening or ideas that you're developing uh, or ideas that you're testing or and slash services, and then your current products as well. These are all um, things that you have access to. Um, you certainly have your, your staff, the people that are working for you, whether um uh, time or full time. Um, some some people are more junior or more senior than others. Uh, you have capacity; these are resources, and you have and you have cash. So think of all these things as potential resources that you can tap into. And then using Seras with these uh, uh, processes, what can you do with these? And there's lots of different things that you can do with them, and you're an expert at that. That's a strength. Tangible resources that you have. You have customer satisfaction level. Level. Of course, if you're doing well, it might be a customer annoyance level. You have reputation of your company. You have morale uh, of people who are working with you. And you have knowledge, capabilities of doing things faster, quicker, uh, cheaper, uh, better, that, that sort of thing. So these are all things that might might consider um, means at hand. Um, what the entrepreneur we're doing uh, and we're not already doing, so a lot of the entrepreneurs they weren't familiar, none of the entrepreneurs were familiar with evacuation, but a lot of them were one way or another practicing the affordable loss principle. Acting with people that knew uh, at a transactional level that with their customers, they were selling things to their customers, but they weren't using the customers um, as effectively as they 
could, in other words, uh, perhaps asking customers for other potential customers that they could do business with, not asking for referrals. They weren't really the entrepreneurs that I was working with weren't really uh, hadn't really defined their goals clearly. Uh, they weren't doing a good job getting stakeholder commitments. That sort of um, creative principle, and therefore they weren't doing a good job developing new means and new goals to help the, to help their businesses grow. Again, research wasn't just a survey. It was me working with, with these entrepreneurs and intervening in their business uh, and knew that I was going to do this. But it had to be done as, as um, uh, in a way where they're still the boss because, you know, you're not going to mess with entrepreneurs. Um, and uh, you help them but not sort of send a direction that they don't want to go in, if that, if that makes sense. So, so, so the interve interventions involved introducing Introducing them to the concept of effectuation. Um, in, in order to help them, we had to um, get some skill sets to help build on their negotiation skills. A lot of the entrepreneurs needed help with marketing, including specifically sales. It's about strategy. Uh, we brought in um, executive coach to help them as well, to help them understand themselves a little bit more. We help them understand more about innovation and creativity. Um, this is sort of what actuation in action looks like. It's sort of that last slide from the video. Um, the two I am, what I know, well, the goals, uh, interacting with people, um, getting stakeholder commitments, which then create new means and new goals. Uh, sometimes there's no commitments, so it's a dead end. The pen metaphor that we were using earlier, the pen example might not work, uh, but something else does. So not everything is going to succeed. of what we, this is how we had to play around with things. So the intervention with the me side of things, we had to get entrepreneurs to increase the use of, reflect. a lot of people running their business and they're, you know, they're working, a, give 110% or a combination of the time they're spending with work and what they're spending with family and their time they're spending with um, other stuff. Their, their time was, was, was very, um, uh, uh, and it always is with, with, with new businesses. So we can get entrepreneurs to stop and reflect a little bit. Um, and I encourage uh, folks on, on who are this later or, or who are doing this now to take some time uh, away from your busy day and put down um, maybe a reflection journal, just some things to just think about as far as what tried, what's working, what's not working. It really does help. Um, interventions regarding interacting with people that I know, um, the entrepreneurs were not doing a great job as a kind of alluded to earlier, um, asking for referrals. Most people, if they're asked for a referral, will give one, an existing customer. Most customers are asked for a referral. Um, and stakeholder commitments, there's an example um, where a couple of times the entrepreneurs were very uncomfortable trying to get a commitment from a much larger company. But in Alaska, sometimes it's the smaller rural businesses really can play a role in the value chain of the larger companies. But the small business owners were intimidated because they thought, well, it's a big company, a small business in rural Alaska. So they needed some help with negotiation and building their own negotiating skills. Um, and those are those the main ones for the purpose of this presentation. So, um, for folks who are looking at this now, folks who look at this later, um, the negotiation worksheet that we developed and shared with folks um, this comes from uh, a lot of comes from Jiren Yuri's uh, book to Yes, as well as the Harvard Negotiation Project. So if you go into a negotiation with a goal, so most you can ask for in this situation, um, I, without getting laughed out of the room, that's my words, um, a reservation point, the least that you'll accept and still be satisfied with the outcome of the negotiation. And then the acronym BATNA, Best Alternative to Negotiated Agreement, if you can go into any negotiation with that, whether it's with a large potential stakeholder or a potential client, um, you, you're in a much better place because you've got more control and you're able to manage the expectations a little bit better. If you want to go one step further, play that exercise uh, for the people that you're negotiating with also to try to understand what their goal, reservation point, and BATNA is. So one of the things, some of the things that we learned, um, we tried to do a lot of work uh, online because that saves on costs. Um, and we did find that incredibly effective. It was somewhat effective, but not effective as it needs to be. Face-to-face um, -face was really, really important. 
I meant uh, reflection being important. I mentioned repetition again. Being able to go over material more than once for for various reasons depends on the entrepreneur. But if you're busy, uh, they're not ready to digest that information, or they just don't get it completely, or maybe we don't do a good job explaining it. Um, and encouraging them to reflect more was was really important. Um, interacting with what the entrepreneur knows, so not just customers, but Sometimes one of the entrepreneurs was able to get a, a huge new client just by um, a relationship with one of the um, the admin people. Uh, even though they were doing business with the president of the customer company, it was it was somebody else who really at that company who was to direct them towards a huge new client. Um, so that's what we learned from the executive coaching side of things, uh, simply in order to keep sort of within the time, time limits of our presentation tonight. Different personality types. Um, did a Myers Briggs personality type indicator with an executive coach. They're more introverted, and some people are more extroverted. Introverts who are very skilled at running businesses, just like extroverts, are. they all have their strengths and weaknesses. But um, the introverts felt very uncomfortable um, putting themselves out there and asking for referrals, and trying to meet new people. Yet that's so critical when you're trying to grow a business, whether it's in rural Alaska or elsewhere. Or other places, and then so um, uh, people sometimes found that their task that they were really good at, that they liked, and they focused on that. that were a, a multitude of tasks that they needed to be doing. For instance, uh, one particular entrepreneur was very good at, at, the, at the, on the production side of things, and again, not spending enough time on the side of things. What we also learned was probably one of the weaknesses was that. That we we did try to hold the entrepreneur accountable. I say we it was more me. I did try to hold the entrepreneur accountable by if they, this is what I'm going to do to overcome uh, the obstacle that I'm facing. Um, the next time we met, I say how did that go? And if they didn't do, it, sometimes they didn't because entrepreneurs get busy. Um, there were no repercussions for that, so there was no sort of pre commitment uh, to to holding them accountable. And then that can be fixed if we brought in executive coaching uh, next time. Um, the ecological metrics that we, we aim for, the, the business did great on the economic side. Um, one of them grew 50, 60 percent, and another grew about 25 percent. The two others, uh, one was down a little bit, and the other was more or less flat. But for the two, it was very successful. Equal metrics, they, they worked to get better, um, but they didn't do a great job um, measuring how much better they were, were doing. Activity and innovation, I'll share something with you on that in a little bit, um, was very helpful. Uh, activity, the the ability to innovate, so the precedes innovation. And one thing that was really interesting, um, working in these smaller rural communities, uh, it's difficult to expand. Often uh, it's difficult to travel. Sometimes traveling to the next community down is, is easy. Sometimes it's not. But on flying through an Anchorage hub or or a Fairbanks hub is necessary to get to where you need to go. And there's a lot of resources um, in those urban areas. And so the, the su more successful entrepreneurs are able to tap into, even though they're headquartered in the rural areas, they're able to tap into expertise in the, in the urban areas when they travel through or they might start a, um, a secondary office in, those, in the larger communities. And that helped them grow as well. Um, I won't go into detail on this just uh, in the, in the uh, try to keep on track for time, but just a map of innovation and different types of innovations that, that the entrepreneurs were introduced to. So it helped them a lot to try to plan uh, whether it's an incremental innovation that they needed to do for new customers uh, or new customers, whether there was a, a really discontinuous something really out there. An example that's in the press really is um, uh, Amazon looking at using drones to deliver packages, right? So, or sort of a, a slight technological change to help its um, business. Different types of innovations for different uh, segments was important for them uh, and helpful for them to grow their business. Um, as before, effectuation was important. Uh, negotiation helped. Uh, merge acquisitions. You know, sometimes looking at uh, how to acquire their business in another community is a good path for growth. Yet the entrepreneurs often were very underskilled and confidence in, in that. Um, there were deficiencies in government programs, which uh, some are great and some not great, but what we there are ways to make them better. Going back to effectuation, the goal is interacting with willing stakeholders 
And if the program that entrepreneurs isn't allowed to give you the names of people, that would have a problem, right? Because entrepreneurs want to know who they should be calling that be able to, to work with them. Um, eco I kind of talked about that a little bit. Um, yeah. And uh, one, one other thing, the, the participatory action research model, plan, act, observe, and reflect, really has to be something very different. It's like this, where by nature are opportunistic. So we'd be in the middle of a cycle of plan, act, observe, reflect, and instead of going forward with the next step, they might go shooting off into another direction, which is great. That's what businesses are all about, especially entrepreneurs. So there could also be multiple cycles of research going on at the same time, especially when we would bring in other folks from the ecological, from the entrepreneurial ecosystem who are helping them. So it was a little bit more complicated than we originally imagined it would be. Um, something that was important, so whether it's the crazy quilt principle or the lemonade principle or the affordable loss principle, um, be afraid of ready aim um, instead of what you might think of as ready aim fire. Sometimes you just have to, as Sarasvati says, you just have to take action and see if it's going to work out for you. That's really important as well because if you do this is plan, 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 aim, or ready, ready, aim, 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 aim fire, uh, and sometimes the opportunity is there and you just need to take a chance at it. Again, curling for the downside with the affordable loss principle. Future research that I'm going to be working on, um, looking at, at move state and uh, nonprofit organizations, and help with entrepreneurs to be more helpful. As earlier, using executive coaching to help entre entrepreneurs get unstuck, especially from tasks they find comfortable and they're most happy with, because tasks as well, um, to spend more time reflecting, uh, the entrepreneurs to spend more time reflecting. And uh, also do more research with uh, sustainability, entrepreneurship, and, and Native Alaskan values. And then I'm still looking to add more participants from more communities. Uh, as well. So those are things that are on the horizon uh, and I think that are important. So um, I've got a few minutes left. Uh, that's how to find me. And a uh, special thanks. You know, I like this plane. We're all pulling together at the Alaska Airlines plane with the, the sled dog uh, for folks who aren't doing the video. But I wanted to thank my advisors uh, through Leeds Metropolitan University, uh, Tony Graham and uh, Duke Bryant and Graham Orange, uh, for their help uh, uh, as far as I did on this. So and with that, I'll turn it over to questions. Um, with Chris, Melissa, Lisa, or um, if you're watching the video, you won't have a chance to ask me questions, but you can find me online, uh, so I'm happy to help. So um, I'll turn it over to you guys. No, Kwani Rick, thank you for that great presentation. Um, Ruth says, thank you. Rick, well, thank you. I don't have any questions, but uh, you opened up my eyes and, and uh, was what I was expecting. Thank you. You're welcome, Chris. Thank you. I think that uh, since no more questions, um, Melissa, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Uh, do you want to say some closing remarks? Yeah, I just want to thank you again, Rick, for being with us. And I want to let folks know, um, just a second reminder, that we do have those last two webinars in the series on September 10th, a week from today at 2 p.m., and September 23rd, just a couple of weeks after that. So if you do register for those, just email N A H O U. S T O N at UAA dot Alaska dot EO. And we'll get you all signed up. So thanks again for being here this evening and I hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you so much uh for inviting me and uh Lisa, thank you for joining us. Uh, Ruth, Chris, thank you as well. Um have a great evening everybody. Thanks. Thank you.